In the pre-dawn hours of June 26, 1945, USS Springer, on her third war patrol, suspended her offensive operations and proceeded to her designated station in the Tokyo Bay area to commence lifeguard duty. Her mission was to stand by to rescue any downed airmen in the day's upcoming B-29 strike on the Japanese aircraft industries in the city of Nagoya. In that same pre-dawn darkness at the American bomber base on the island of Tinian, Captain William Pitts and his crew of the B-29 Dynamite were preparing to climb aboard for the 1,500-mile run to Japan. With 24 missions under their belt, they were beginning to feel invincible. Little did they know they were on their way to an unplanned rendezvous with a member of the Submarine Lifeguard League, 10 miles off the coast of Japan. By June 1945, the U.S. Submarine Force had close to two years' experience rescuing downed aviators. Beginning in October 1943, when USS Skate, operating with the task force during a strike against Wake Island, picked up six Zoomies, which is the submariner's name for downed aviators, from the carrier Lexington. From that day, throughout the entire island hopping campaign across the Central Pacific, from Tarawa to Okinawa, no important carrier strike was made without one or more lifeguard submarines on station. Throughout 1944, submarines constantly developed and improvised new tactics to increase the success of the rescue missions, such as Lieutenant Commander Sam Dealey's daring rescue of beached aviators by positioning USS Harder against a reef in broad daylight just off enemy-controlled Walea in the Marshall Islands. Alternatively, USS Stingray's use of its periscope to rescue a pilot in a procedure known as scoping allowed the boat to remain submerged to avoid exposure to enemy guns on shore as it dragged the pilot to safety. Or USS Tang's historic rescue of 22 Navy pilots in two days near Truck Island in late April 1944. One of the rescues made with the assistance of a floatplane, which ferried rescued pilots to Tang on its wings. By the end of 1944, U.S. submarines had rescued 140 aviators, including USS Finback's rescue of Lieutenant Junior Grade George Herbert Walker Bush, later to become the 41st President of the United States. In 1945, those numbers would increase dramatically. By the time the crew of Dynamite was preparing to take off on their 25th bombing mission, U.S. Army Air Force's heavy bombers were operating practically around the clock against the home islands Japan. It was clear that air power now had the decisive role in paving the way for the Allied invasion of Japan, and consequently, the operational focus for American submarines shifted to lifeguarding. Despite the success of lifeguard submarines in rescuing Navy carrier-based aviators, Army air crews were initially skeptical of submarine rescue. Most bomber pilots would rather fly a damaged plane back to base on a wing and a prayer rather than ditch it in the ocean and wait for a submarine. In order to promote confidence and shared experience, bomber crews were invited to use the Submarine Rest and Relaxation Center at Camp Dealey in Guam, and pilots were taken out for training dives in submarines. Advancements were made in flotation and survival gear, and in the methods of locating downed planes. 21 large Navy seaplanes called Dumbos were employed to search for downed zoomies and guide lifeguard submarines to the spot. By the time Dynamite's crew took off on June 26 for its bombing run, all the pieces were in place to ensure the crew's safe return, should they find themselves no longer invincible. At 25,000 feet, while still approaching the Japanese mainland, Dynamite's luck ran out. A break in the clouds brought sun and a Japanese fighter that immediately banked and fired, hitting the nose and wing with devastating effect. The order to bail out was given. Seven parachutes soon opened, and the eighth appeared several seconds later in the distance. Sergeant Bob Thomas, the eighth man, had waited an extra ten seconds to yank his ripcord, thinking in that way he would hang as a helpless target for less time. Unfortunately, it also carried him away from the rest of the crew. Seven wet airmen grouped their four rafts together, unsure of the fate of Sergeant Thomas. A brief heated argument broke out between two of the airmen about whether they should paddle 750 miles south to American-held Iwo Jima or ten miles to Japan and take their chance until a Dumbo swooped in over the rafts. A radio report went out to the network of submarine lifeguards. It was received by Springer, which proceeded at flank speed toward the location. After four hours in the water, the airmen spotted the huge bow wave of Springer racing towards them. The men were quickly brought aboard. Time was of the essence. The water was too shallow to dive, 
and an air attack by Japanese planes could mean death to the men on deck. Captain Pitts implored Lieutenant Commander Bauer, Springer's commanding officer, to find the remaining separated dynamite crew member. The Dumbo had spotted Sergeant Thomas a mile closer to the Japanese shore. Bauer knew that the risks were increasing by the minute, but he headed in the direction Sergeant Thomas was last spotted. Suddenly, one of the lookouts called out, Sir, I think I've spotted something in the water. A couple of minutes later, Springer's designated swimmer was hauling the last airman aboard. Well, at this time, they, uh, they kept telling us that there was another aviator out there that wasn't with the group. And uh, we said we'd try to look for him as soon as we got the others picked up, but we were lucky. Here's a life uh, jacket was only half inflated and he had to keep swimming a little bit to uh, keep him afloat. He'd been in the water for about four hours and he was just about ready to go under. He said he'd given up. We hadn't picked him up another 15 or 20 minutes. He said he would have probably drowned. He was so weak he couldn't, he couldn't move his arms or legs anymore. Shortly, Dynamite's crew would be transferred to a passing submarine. The war was over for them, and they would soon be heading home. The war for Springer and the rest of the Submarine Lifeguard League would continue for another two months. By the time the Japanese surrendered, 86 American submarines had rescued 504 aviators of Army, Navy, Marine, and British forces. <laughs>